absolutely loaded Locked on MLB prospects today. We spent our time talking to Josh Neighbors of Locked on Nationals about international free agency. Second year in a row, the Nationals have went big for a guy, in this case, outfielder Christian Vaccaro from Cuba. Is he worth it? And pitcher Seth Romero got arrested for a DWI. At what point do you give up on a top prospect? All this and more on today's Locked on MLB Prospects. You are Locked on MLB Prospects, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody. Josh Neighbors here. This is a crossover edition of the Locked On Nationals and Locked On Prospects podcast here. Uh, once again, I'm Josh Neighbors. Lindsey Crosby in the house. There's a whole lot to get to, and it comes it comes to the the Nationals and prospects right now. So glad to talk to you. You guys have absolutely been bit. Be- been busy recently. I actually led off Monday's show talking about uh, what you guys did in international free agency. So let's get after it. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, this is this is kind of a time where the Nationals have have shined, if you will. Um, they're really bad. I think it's fair to say they're bad at developing prospects. Normally, like the the, you know, the guys that are let's just say the American kids is is the one that the ones they have some problems with. Um, you know, but the internet the international free agency has been a uh, has been a pretty good, uh, you know, experience for them. And they just signed Christian Vaccaro, uh, $4.9 million, uh, is the signing bonus. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand how this works, how this process works. So explain to folks why international kids are separated from the draft, why these two things are not together and, and kind of how this process for international kids works to, as opposed to the scouting process for, you know, kids in high school and in college. Absolutely. And if you want some more insight behind the whole process, la- uh, last Wednesday's episode of Locked on MLB Prospects, we actually brought in Jeff Paternoster from Baseball Prospectus, and he mm-hmm. and I spent about 30 minutes breaking this down in detail. But the long story short on this is there's not the the same infrastructure for youth baseball in Latin America like there is in the States. And so anybody who's not part of the U.S. or Canada – is put into free agency internationally. The way that works is a lot of the teams, I think now that Cuba's building of the, now that, that the Orioles are building their Academy, all 32 teams now have academies in Latin America. They'll send scouts Mm -hmm. down there. They'll start scouting these kids when they're, I mean, 11, 12 years old. And oftentimes the teams will go ahead and have verbal agreements in place with some of these players around age 14. And where this is different from domestic when it comes to the draft and free agency and everything is in Latin America, once you have a verbal commitment with a team, the other teams stop scouting you. Mm. And so some of these players haven't been seen by any other MLB team except for the one that they're signing with since 2019. Uh, But typically what they'll do is they will make a verbal agreement with the team. Once they have turned 16, the next international free agency date after that, which is the second year it's been moved to January instead of July. uh, They will go ahead and sign that deal. They have up to 11 months to sign the deal. They don't have to do it on Saturday. That's just the first day they're allowed to Um, after 11 months. Anybody who hasn't signed uh, can has to wait a one month dead period. And whatever bonus money is left over that your team has, because the bonus pools are also set by MLB and they're structured based on how much money you spent in free agency last year. Uh, Any money you have left in that pool at the end of the 11 months is forfeit. So a lot of teams try to make sure they have commitments for most of this money a year out. Even though you can't legally announce these deals until two weeks before signing day, they've had these deals in place for two years or so. Hmm. So it, it, it kind of reminds me, you know, the way you describe it, much like international soccer. This is this is kind of the model that international soccer uses. Now they get those kids in. Uh, maybe the scouting is the same age, but they get those kids in a lot earlier. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so many of them do not end up at the club that you know that they sign with. Um, this is a bit different, right? These kids usually end up playing, at least in the minors, for the clubs that sign them. Yeah. So typically, once a like. I want to say guy, but once a kid signs, they'll sign at age 16, maybe 17. They'll typically spend the next calendar year 
still in Latin America. They'll play winter ball, they'll play summer ball, and then the next spring they'll make it into the States and they'll actually enter rookie ball and then usually low A or high A. So most of these guys will make it at least to high A. And the thing about international free agency is this is where teams can really get um, bang for their buck. They can sign a lot of players and it's, you can get more players through free agency internationally than you can through the MLB draft. And so a lot of organizations rely on these young kids to fill out their entire lower mm. levels of their minor league system. Even if it's a guy that they don't necessarily think has a shot to make it to the pros, it might be $5,000 or $8,000 that he gets to sign. And so you can go ahead and sign him. There's a very small financial contribution uh, from your on your part. But if they even play – you know, a month of games in your minor league system, financially it was worth it. So teams will typically max out that entire pool and sign as many players as possible. But the Nationals have done something a little bit different with their approach. And I kind of appreciate what they've done the last two years. Yeah, so the, the, the big gun they bring in here, and they were rumored for, there are a couple of guys that they, that they were the favorites to land, but they end up landing Christian Vaccaro. And a lot of fans, you know, they, they see the news, but they're not familiar with the player because he's 17 years old and obviously he plays internationally, right? This is not a – and I'd even say, you know, even for kids that get drafted in the MLB draft, sometimes, one, they're high schoolers, so fans definitely have not seen them. Mm-hmm. And two, you know, there's a lot of fans who watch a lot of college baseball, right? I mean, there are some diehards who do. Uh, you know, I've enjoyed my fair share of college baseball when I was – in school covering it, you know, in the SEC and got to see a lot of those kids are awesome, but not a lot of people going out of their way to see these kids. And these kids are even further removed. So Christian Vaccaro, they hear a lot of stuff about him, but what can fans expect from him? And I expect in in quotations because they're not going to see him immediately, right? This is not a guy you're going to see in the major leagues anytime soon, but what can they expect? What kind of player are they getting? Okay. So, uh, He's 6'3", 180, so he's, he has good size for a center fielder. And when you watch him defensively, he's pretty good already. He's got plus speed, he's got good defensive instincts, and he has a plus arm. So you feel like he's a guy that can actually stick at center versus you know the best athlete who's in center and has to move to a corner later. Uh, offensively, obviously, you know bat's left-handed, but he has a, a, a fundamentally sound swing. So he's got plus power potential. He does need to fill out his frame a little bit. 6'3", 180 is a little on the skinnier side, Uh, but it's very projectable. He doesn't have a lot of bad weight. He can get stronger. He can kind of grow into those power tools. He has picked up switch hitting recently based off some of the recent reports. Like since since 2019, you know, over the layoff, he worked a little bit on switch hitting. Uh, It's still a project. His right-handed swing isn't anything special, but it does look like he's a guy that, offensively and defensively should be able to, if everything breaks right, to play center field for quite a few years in Washington. What's the timetable for kids like this? You know, for, for guys who are blue chippers, if you will, towards the top side of the, uh, you know, and I mean, I'm not sure if it's a fan of other sports, but like, could you give a compare, you know, is this a strong class of international free agents? Is this a weaker class of international free agents? Is the dollar value there for him because he is the top guy and you know it just in this class and it happens to be he's getting that money? Like if you could make a comp, maybe you know how strong is the class, stuff like that. So people have an yeah. idea of kind of what what this is. What what does it mean they're signing Christian Vaccaro? Okay, so so this is one of the classes where we actually don't have as much information. This class and last year's class, because of the pandemic, because of the shutdown, we we missed a lot of of in-person scouting of a lot of players now some like a guy like christian vaquero obviously he got a big bonus because we do have some film we do have some video of him we this is a a pretty decent class of prospects but he is more of a known quantity than a lot of other guys and part of that's because he's from cuba as compared to where a lot of guys are from the dominican venezuela uh, stuff like that. And so he's played a little bit more competitive baseball. He's played with some of the Cuban national teams that do stuff as, as youth. So we have a little more information on him. Uh, the class as a whole, a lot of stuff to still figure out, but I feel good about him. Uh, same thing with last year's guy, Armando Cruz, same idea, big, big bonus. And uh, right. another player that we have more information on than your average international signee, simply because of the situations around where he played. 
we know more about it. So we feel a little better projecting that out. And the, the kind of question on this, is there any, is there any part of the process that's different with kids from Cuba as compared to other places due to the, you know, I guess political situation is one way to say it, but just kind of the, you know, the government situation, I guess you could say. Uh, so there is one extra step because oftentimes they have to defect first. And so that can mess some of them up. The, I believe it's Seattle signed a guy this year. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Chicago signed a guy this year that hasn't played competitively since 2019 because he had to, to make the, the, the deadline on when he could defect to a different country. And then he was embroiled in a little bit of a political issue he had to get resolved. And so he hasn't been able to play in a few years. Christian Vaccaro is going to be able to, he'll probably be able to make it up. Um, he could theoretically come up for the spring and play this year. I don't think they're going to do that with him, but he because he's a little bit older, uh, they could put him in right away. And oftentimes you see Cuban players go in right away. The White Sox like to recruit and sign Cuban players because they can enter the minor leagues immediately. Usually they're a little mm -hmm. bit older, a little bit higher level of competition they faced. Vaquero is a guy that could do that. We just don't know if he's going to come this year or if he's going to come next year. He might make it to the States after the draft, whereas a lot of guys would wait until the next spring. So, so if he's if he goes stateside, he'll be in the what do they call it? I mean, development is uh, I always forget what they call it, like the low, low, low. The Florida league. Complex League is kind right, of what yes. we'll do. Yeah. Now, if he does not come to the United States, what will his baseball season, if you will, look like while he is in Cuba? So so he actually physically is in the Dominican right now. He's still a, a, a Cuban citizen, but he's defected. So yes. he'll play in the, the Dominican Summer League and then the Dominican Winter League if he doesn't make it to the States. But given that he's a little bit older, I like maybe letting him play in the Summer League and then come up and let him catch the tail end of rookie ball. Because a lot of the the – teams and the nationals are included in that they like to get the draftees into something right after the draft and give them some time to acclimate before they take a break for the winter. So I expect them to bring him up no later than the draft and let him spend some time this fall so that he can start off and get a full year in single a next year. And another guy you're interested in is, is Armando Cruz. Uh, and, and you've mentioned him already here some, but uh, now they're number 10 prospect the guy they got last season uh, you know, what, what can fans expect from, from a player like this? If they're, what do they want to track him? What, what should they look for kind of developmentally to see, Hey, what does he need to do to get to the, the major leagues in a relatively normal or even faster fashion? Okay. So same thing as, as Vaquero, obviously big bonus last year, the star of the class. Um, he, I would expect him to come stateside this year. He played in the Dominican summer league. He played in the winter league. I expect him to be here. This spring, once spring training ever happens, fantastic defensive shortstop, um, both physically and mentally. He has not only quick feet and a plus arm and a good transfer, but he has great instincts. You rarely see him uh, take the wrong step at the crack of the bat. You rarely see him be out of position to make a play. And I would go so far as to say when he does make it to Washington, I think the day he debuts in MLB, he's probably defensively going to be one of the five best shortstops in Major League Baseball when he debuts. I mean, he's he's that skilled, and that's part of the reason he got such a great bonus. Now, offensively, he's very much a work in progress. Uh, as he matures and adds strength, and we haven't gotten a ton of reports out of how he did in the Dominican Summer League, but as he adds strength, I still don't think he'll be a huge power threat, but if he can just get to average offensively, He's going to be a great addition to Washington simply because the bat is so incredibly, I'm sorry, the his defense is so high level yeah, yeah. and so elite. Um, so when, when teams stockpile multiple guys like at a position, right? So you, you give, you invest heavily in Armando Cruz, you invest heavily in Brady house. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what does that look like? Like, are, are you, are you saying, okay, at least one of these two guys will pan out and be a, uh, a shortstop for us, or is the idea like, you know, we're going to bump one of these guys to third at some point in time. What, what's kind of the calculus? Because you see in other sports, you know, you, you don't usually just repetitively draft uh, at the same position. Right. So, so there's two factors at play here. The first factor is typically your best athletes on the baseball field, especially in youth baseball are going to be shortstop and center field. So part of it is there's so many more shortstops. If you're drafting somebody, 
uh, or you're signing a free agent who's in, you know, internationally as like a first baseman, he's somebody who was limited enough in youth athletically that he's probably not going to work out at the MLB level. So part of it's just, there's so many shortstops, but then part of it too is as they develop, some guys will either skills or body will just outgrow the position. Brady house is a guy and I had some notes on him, uh, for later, but he's a guy who I really think is going to end up outgrowing short and is probably going to be a corner infielder, third or first. And I, I don't do a ton of player comps just because I don't like to give people uh, you know, bad expectations. But when I watch Brady House, I really think about watching Austin Riley at double A Mississippi, just kind of how Austin big, Riley big kid, right? Big, big, yeah, big he, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean like big hit can hit the ball with authority to all mm-hmm. fields, but it's not just all muscle. I mean, he's got great bat speed. He has a bat path that's geared for power. And, and so, you know, and he's a good enough athlete where you can stick him at a corner and he can pick it up pretty quickly. You can stick him. Austin Riley spent a year playing the outfield for Atlanta and looked pretty right. good. And I, I feel like Brady House is somebody you could do that with as well. But for him, it's really just a – I mean, he's already 215. He's probably going to put on an extra 5 or 10 pounds of muscle, and I just don't think he's going to have uh, the same the same speed and range to play a shortstop at a above-average level, but he could play a pretty good defensive third base. So I think that's what it is. Is It's a combination of there's so many guys at that position, and right. not all of them – physically or athletically are going to to be able to stick at that spot like Brady House is a guy who like I said I I expect him to be your third or first baseman I could see him being the successor to Josh Bell at first very Mm. easily not necessarily saying that that's the best place for him that might be a um, a waste of some of his athletic talents but he definitely could do that in the future for the Washington Nationals It's the new year, and new year means new year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, check out Built Bars. Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. It's the only protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. 130 calories, 17 grams of protein. It's great for you. So go to Built.com, check out all the flavors. Coconut almond, peanut butter brownie, raspberry cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie just some of the regulars, and then they have stuff in rotation, limited time things that come out all the time. So go to built.com. While you're there, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 at built.com. All right, so news we have to hit here, and this this hits a prospect who is, you know, this is a story in sports that we see all the time, kind of a troubled, very talented player. Seth Romero gets a DWI this past weekend back in Texas where he is from. This has been a recurring theme for him. And the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this is that, you know, it's it's the interesting idea of, all right, has the kid had so many chances to where you got to cut him loose? But on the other side of it, somebody's going to pick him up, right? It, it's almost like once, once the team that has the player that Fs up, cuts the kid loose or cuts the player, but they don't be kids, cuts them loose, depending on the um, the crime, if you will, it, it kind of absolves them in a way. It's, it's kind of like, okay, I get my fresh start now. But if you're the Nationals, do you cut a kid loose when you know that somebody else is going to pick up pick him up and be like, you know what, fresh start here in Cleveland, fresh start here in Cincinnati, or even worse, fresh start here in Atlanta, fresh start here in Miami, fresh start here in Philadelphia – you get the idea of what yeah. I'm saying here. Uh, fresh start in New York, right? So where do you kind of come down in the situation? Because this is somebody that, you know, you and I you and I were talking before. It's not going to be a very good baseball team next year, the Nationals. Perfect opportunity to get a guy like Seth Romero either in your pen or maybe, depending on how things go, in the rotation at some point just to give him some looks and see how he is. You know, what do you think of this situation playing out right now for Seth Romero and the Nats? So what's tough about this situation? I mean, and obviously there's a lot going on and, you know, right. but they've seen so little of him, but what they've seen of him has looked really good. I mean, his, his, his stuff isn't, he, he, you're still kind of projecting what Seth Romero is going to be, but what you've seen, I mean, he's had off the field troubles. He's had Tommy John. So he didn't pitch above, you know, a until 2020. Above low A, he went to the alternate training site. He came up for a, for a, I think, what three appearances in August 2020. Hurt his non throwing hand, ended his season there. But what they've seen, I mean, he's got he's got um, a fastball that 
Looks good. I wouldn't say great, but looks good. He's got a slider that is, I mean, a plus pitch. It's pretty nasty. He's got a change up. It's a, like it's a complete separator. Uh, he has, he seems to have the right demeanor. He's fearless. He attacks the zone. He can throw all of his pitches for strikes. He has the makeup of a guy who would be a great starter. They just haven't seen enough of him. And I understand, like, as much as I want to think, okay, this kid screwed up multiple times. They're going to just rid their hands of him. It's like you said, someone's going to pick him up if they do. Right. And so, and if there's a team that can afford to lose a pitcher, I feel like like the Nationals have a lot of pitching prospects, but I the understand problem is none why of them they make don't it. want it. None of them make it, man. You I was know? about to say, the yeah. thing is, they're not going to want to get rid of him because he's right. so promising. And so I think you're going to see Washington find a way to keep him. And I feel like mm-hmm. every organization can take on one player who has significant off-the-field issues and is in the news for the wrong reasons, and you can kind of get away with – with rehabbing the image of one guy. And I think the fact that he hasn't spent a lot of time above low A makes it easier for them to do that. I would expect Washington to try to quietly, like they may quietly suspend him. They may, you know, not put a lot of publicity on what they do, but I expect them to keep him in the organization simply because, like you said, so many of the pitchers haven't been panning out recently and he looks like he might if they can ever get him um, sustained appearances at a minor league level to show them what he can do. So as much as I'd love for him to just be done with baseball altogether, because he seems like maybe he's not the right character fit for the game. I fully expect Washington to find a way to keep him in the system and he can be the rehab project kind of like Ozuna, Roberto Ozuna was for the Astros where Mm -hmm. they came, they came in and they said, well, he's our one rehab project we're going to work on and we can get away with this because he's the only one. I don't feel like there's anybody else in the system right now who's having noteworthy problems like this. They could probably get away with it. And, and I would say the you know the and Roberto Zuna is a good point of you know having the one guy. I would say like what what he is doing is not on to me. This is personal opinion, but you know on the level of of the atrocity right now, it's very dangerous. It could be awful. We saw Henry Ruggs, wide receiver for the, the Oakland Raiders this year. Oakland Raiders, Las Vegas have an awful situation, right? Just, mm-hmm completely horrible and awful situation. And then he's putting himself in those spots, but the shock factor, I think, which matters when you're talking about, you know, keeping people like this new team, the shock factor is lower. So you can afford, in my opinion, you know, this is something that probably I would say 90% of that, 90% of nationals fans will not know this happened. And I'll just say people watch the games, people who are, you know, are in the stand, you can go around and poll them probably and say, do you know about Seth Romero's DWI? They probably say no. They probably say they might even say, "Hey, who's Seth Romero?" Romero. Right. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's one of those things that you can get away with. I think the frustration would be for the Nationals. How many times are we going to have this conversation? I think he got sent home from camp a couple of years ago. You, you know, the reason why they were able to draft him where they drafted him was because the issues he had at the University of Houston. And mm-hmm. so this is a kid that it's just how many times will you put up with it? Uh, but then once we talked about the other side of it is like, do you want to see him go somewhere else? Because and especially for a team, you know, that that's like he, he might have it. He might. And for a team that's guys that got, got like Eric Fetty, you know what I mean? Who is a, a, another guy who's a first round pick who not an off pitcher, pitcher, not, not the worst pitcher in the world, but right. somebody who does not appear to be an effective third, fourth, maybe even fifth starter, right? Uh, on, a, on a potentially winning team, you know, this guy could be a first round pick that actually pans out for them. And for a team that's missed so often, I feel like it's just too valuable of an asset for them to let go in the end of the cover. Kind of, you know, once we hit the conversation ending point, I feel it's like they just can't let him go. Yeah. And like you said, I think the, the differentiator here is the fact that he is so low in the system. If he was a member of the, of the Washington bullpen and he was one of those guys that you flex, right. he made spot starts. He was, he was in Washington I don't think he'd be part of the organization. I think he, they would have already, well, they can't right now with a lockout, but I think in a normal off season, they would have already cut ties with him if he was one of those on the cusp of breaking out and just hadn't done it, but he was in Washington and they got the publicity. I feel like other than locally in Houston, you're not going to hear a ton about this. And I think you're right when most fans probably wouldn't even know who he was. And so I ex- fully expect them to keep him again. Can't say it's warranted, but I right. fully expect them to keep him and, kind of just maybe let him know this is your last chance. Right. This is your final warning. Anything else and you're gone. And 
And I would understand. I, I don't can't say I love it, but I would understand that situation. Is this a kid at twenty? Because because to me, at, at his age, I think it's about time they they you know I know he's not got a ton of experience above as you said the high level, but like this is somebody that I would accelerate this year and give a shot at the major leagues. Now we saw him a bit in twenty twenty. You know, there's a lot of factors there for why he was up there in twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. But this is somebody that I think at that age, it's like, all right, man, if this if it's going to be like this, like we're going to see what you got because yeah. we're not going to put up with this. You know what? If you're going to keep acting like this, is this somebody you'd accelerate and say, all right, we're not going to try. We're not trying to win this year. So it's time for guys like you to get a look and you got to prove it to us. Probably what I do is I start him off at Harrisburg. I, I give him five starts in Harrisburg. And if he can, you know, look, give me quality starts in four of those five, I'm probably bringing him to Washington and letting him learn on the job. And one of the big things that I've I've noticed is when you're not a contending team, that is the right time to bring those young pitchers up and let them work it out at the major league level. Contrast right. it to a team like Atlanta, who who has been in the hunt the last few years and they've been trying to win the division, trying to catch up to the Mets last year. And so if they they bring a pitcher up. And he'd have a good start, two good starts. And then the first time he struggled, they'd have to send him back down because they needed to keep winning. And so he's a guy, start him off at Harrisburg, give him, give him a month. If he gives you some quality starts, can look like he's, he's figured out a little bit more moving on that fastball, bring him up, let him go to the all-star break, see how he does. Now, I would be mindful of his workload. And this is something, if you listen to Lockton and MLB prospects last Monday, you'll hear us talk about guys who have had big workload increases because he's missed Mm -hmm. so much time. You have to be mindful of how much can he really contribute this year? Uh, Obviously missed the entire 2019 year because of, um, because of Tommy John limited appearances in 2020 because there was no season. And then obviously he, I think he played in what um, 10 games last year between um, single A, double A, and triple A? Yeah, not much. Not much. Yeah, n- not much. And and look look pretty good. I mean, strikeouts per nine. He's striking out everybody. And the big thing for him is he's left-handed. They, the yeah. Nationals lack a mm-hmm. left-handed, you know, a, a, a guy who could be potentially a great left hand. That, that, to me, is like one of the big factors that, you know, I should have mentioned earlier, but they need one desperately yeah. in the bullpen. So that, that's a big part of it. I absolutely think. But if you bring him up, I think you need to let him start. You need to give him the opportunities to, to start. Right. And right. that's just an organizational philosophy I have of don't ever take somebody with the intention of making them a reliever. Like, yeah, it, that's fair. You know, yeah. Because you drafted try. him as a first round starter. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Exactly. On that. Like, and except for the absolute fringe cases that just this guy is is a dominant college closer already, like Kevin Copps from Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, he was a guy. He's absolutely. You're bringing him in to be a reliever. We all right. know that. But for the right. most part, give him a chance to start. If that doesn't work out, you have the option to move him to the bullpen still. But yeah, he needs to be getting Major League Baseball innings no later than than May, simply yeah. so you can figure out what you have and kind of make sure he knows this is his last chance. And then also, when you're around the veterans, it's a little bit different as far as a young guy who needs to mature a bit, needs to learn um, You know that you are more than your bonus it's good to be around the veterans and to have them kind of be able to set you straight and tell you, this is how you need to act. This is how you need to behave as a professional. So I think that'd be good for him. And it's very fair. But online wants to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our March through the NFL playoffs. His bet online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. So on this new year, take advantage of this new updated desktop and mobile website to sign up today and get your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. The promo code is locked on to get started. Whether it's football, basketball, hockey, boxing, or UFC, you can take advantage of all of the amazing offers across all of 2022 because Bet Online is the easiest and fastest way to wager on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, so Lindsay, what we're going to do is we're going to take a pause here. We're going to do a part two of this. But before we do, uh, where can people find you and all of your work and its variety? All right, so I am on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Farm. And you can subscribe to Locked On MLB Prospects uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We are free and available on all platforms every single day. You guys can find me on Twitter at Josh Neighbors underscore. You guys can find the show at LO underscore Nationals. 
And the same thing goes anywhere you get your podcasts. And also we're on YouTube as well. All right. Part two is coming up, depending on what show you're listening to at different times. But there is a part two of this conversation. Thank you.